So, well, we don't have to stick to any particular agenda today, but the topics we raised last time to continue discussion were AI regulation and uh, the prospects for countries that aren't likely to be at the cutting edge, <coughs> excuse me, at the cutting edge of training very large models, if that is indeed the path towards AGI, which seems where one should place one's bets for the moment. Uh, maybe I'd like to start with a second. Um, any objections? Seems not. Okay, so the, the premise of this discussion is that right now America is clearly ahead, uh, depending how you count deep mind in London, whether you count that as part of the UK or part of the US. Uh, maybe you saw that <laughs> the trajectory of deep mind is quite interesting. So. DeepMind started as DeepMind, right? a startup not belonging to anybody. Then it was acquired by Google and became Google DeepMind. And then at some point they changed their name back to DeepMind. And I missed that actually, that was in 2015. I didn't notice that. I have some merch around here with Google DeepMind on it from 2014 or something. So they actually became DeepMind again. I think they were trying very, very hard to separate themselves from Google in terms of uh, trying to have more uh, autonomy. And now they've merged with Google Brain, which was their kind of uh, competitor within the, the Google uh, hierarchy. And now they're called Google DeepMind again. <laughs> so it's quite amusing. I think that it means probably Google Brain is now under the control of DeepMind. Uh, Demis Asabas is the CEO of the new org. I don't know what that means internally, uh, but anyway, that's that's a kind of interesting historical anecdote. Okay, so the UK, the US, China have these large orgs spending billions of dollars training large models. Let's suppose for the sake of argument that that leads to AGI. Australia doesn't have anything like that, not likely to have anything like that uh, in the f near term. Is that a problem for a country like Australia? Is it a problem for Spain and Portugal and France and any other country that's not likely to have uh, billions of dollars and cutting edge tech companies with hundreds of very uh, specifically competent engineers in these domains. Um, we discussed this briefly a couple of months ago and Adam's response I thought was interesting. I don't know if you'd want to update that, Adam. I think he said something like, well, if you look at, uh, if you look at search engines, uh, Australia doesn't have its own search engine. We use Google or Bing, I suppose you could use Bing. That's not a problem for us. It doesn't seem. Right. I mean, from the point of view of privacy, I guess it is. If everybody uses Gmail, then the email accounts of Australians are all on American servers. But beyond that, it doesn't seem like a geopolitical risk. You could think the same is going to be true of large language models. So, for example, uh, Canva and Atlassian, are the two uh, most obvious large tech companies in Australia, um, they're valued at more than a billion dollars. Maybe you've heard of both of them. They sort of come up naturally in the news. I see them in international tech news. Uh, they are adopting generative AI, uh, probably trained in-house on models they're hosting on cloud servers somewhere. They probably won't have an equivalent of GPT-4. I don't think they have any interest in training that. They're making use of the foreign version. Seems okay. Um, is that... Is that a geopolitical risk going forward or is it just like a search engine or uh, many other things which Australia imports? So yeah, that's the framing for a discussion I'd like to have. Um, so I'll open comments, uh, invite comments on that. And then maybe I'll say a little bit about the structure of Australia's economy um, as just as a kind of example case going forward. Well, just for context on the search engine, analogy or metaphor um, or parallel, whichever is more operative in, uh, for comparison here. Uh, one of the one of the prominent 
parts of the narrative around the search engine the history of search engines and the, the competitive race that was run and that Google seemed to win was uh, that Google's search engine simply outperformed its competitor in the early days. I think that, and then it was able to, to capture a large share of the market and has subsequently retained that large share, deservedly or not. Perhaps not. It, it's, it's, I've seen some interesting pieces over the years talking about how the quality of Google's search has declined, um, at, at least partly out of being corrupted by a uh, variety of incentives, a lot of them straightforward, some of them perverse. Um, but Google's, regardless of whether Google search is as good as it once was or whether it's as good as it could be, the, in the early days, Google search was quite a bit better than Yahoo and Excite and like those, and, you know, Web Spider and all, all of the many others that were in that in the race initially. And I wonder if this is operative here, because although it's true that it looks like it's possible to take the basic transformer based technology behind LLMs um, and train models that are quite capable. Uh, it, it, there, there's an open question of whether there, you know, at the at the edge, the performance differences between the leader or leaders and those also in the race but runners up, whether that difference is going to be large in any absolute sense, and then in a more relative sense, whether the difference in performance is going to be large enough that users will overwhelmingly prefer the the leading highest performance services instead of the runners up that perform somewhat but just not quite as well mm. and uh, i think that this is this is probably important to think about because i'm seeing a lot of perhaps it's just another example of copium which we've seen a, a fair amount of in different forms over the last six months at least i think we have um, it may be another form of copium, which is to say, well, uh, a unipolar, a unipolar world, a singleton, a, you know, AI system uh, is unlikely to emerge because it's it's easy enough to just train your own large language model, and everybody will have a GPT equivalent system, and and uh, it will be competitive enough, and open source versions will compete with the closed source uh, offerings of private companies and Governments will be able to stay right at the edge, you know, the, the leading, the bleeding edge. Uh, I, I, I don't know that that's the case. That almost that assumes that the differences between these models in terms of performance and quality are immaterial from the perspective of users. I don't know how you guys feel about that. For me personally, I've tried a number of the different systems that are on offer, and GPT-4 from OpenAI really does seem to outperform the others. I find myself. Uh, getting frustrated if I use GPT 3.5 even for example by comparison yeah and I tried um, I tried a number of other ones some of the smaller models and it's 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 funny how quickly you become accustomed to and then expect a certain level of performance or quality you become very you very quickly take it for granted become become you know if it's like first world problem oh my god <laughs> And I, you know, it seems ridiculous. Except I think what that translates into is is among the public and users. Um, uh, I think it's I think I personally think it's unrealistic to expect that people will settle for a low performance model. I think it's much more realistic to expect that that users will will have very little allegiance and will switch very quickly and readily to something that's that's substantially or sorry to something that's better, even if it isn't really all substantially all that better. Um, so anyway, I, that, these are just, you know, some flavor and some context for this general conversation. Yeah, just to insert an anecdote there. So Lavender works with GPT-4 every day, all day until she hits the cap. Um, and she, when she, she says we're dropping back to 3.5 is like having a collaborator that comes to work drunk. <laughs> like it's just, it's, it's just <laughs> dense. Awesome. Yeah. That's crazy. That's funny. Yeah, I guess there's the question of. Um, oh, sorry, Matt. Did you want to add something? 
Um, just on that point about allegiance, I feel like um, I wonder if you can build um, like allegiance through like if the if the quality of your collaboration with a chatbot depends on the history that you've had with the chatbot, um, you can kind of get a it's not quite a network effect, um, but it's like uh, it, it, I mean they have no incentive to make your history portable and um, yeah. like open and exportable, so that you can just take you can just download your conversational history with one chatbot and upload it to the next and have them continue the collaboration, but with you know, even more sober. Um, so, yeah, I wonder if that effect might um, play, a, play a role. Yeah, I guess it's not only the history of your interactions, right? You could, you could think about it as being analogous to corporate culture, right? It's, it's partly history, but it's partly distributed knowledge. That's, I mean, maybe the system is fine-tuned on its interactions with you. You could easily become very, yeah. very productive with a fine-tuned model that the the particular company has zero incentive to share that's actually the product they they provided for you it's not not just your interactions with it or some sort of data that seems like it should belong to you because you you literally said it it seems like it's probably a stronger argument that it's their property right yeah especially if these um if sort of characters become like a um a part of the framework more so then it's kind of like the prospect is like do you do you leave your friend group behind and go and start associating with a new friend group of smarter people or something like that mm -hmm. um, yeah that that's like that's like difficult um that's a difficult proposition resting on like social intuitions that i have about you know forming relationships with between people so it could be kind of similar to that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess there's, there's the axis of open source models versus centralized models. And as Adam said, the, the open source ones will be smaller and a bit behind the, the cutting edge. And then it's a, a question of how far they will lag behind, uh, I guess, as with open source. Uh, you know, it's, it's important to, to note that the, the reason why open source is so successful is not only because there are lots of generous people in the world willing to share their code, but that there are competitive dynamics between very large, deep-pocketed companies which want to commoditize their complement, right? They want to make open source the thing the other company does, but they don't care about in order to reduce their own costs and take advantage of scale effects. Um, and as a result, we've sort of, you know, gotten the peace dividend of that that particular kind of war between the tech companies and very similarly with the open source models you can see that uh, some of the companies which aren't on the cutting edge have incentives to band together and for example help fund stability ai or whoever's going to open source and uh, do rlhf for for a large language model you can expect that to continue and it's it's very unclear um, how the effects work out there. I mean, you could have you could have predicted Linux could never compete with Microsoft's operating systems in servers, but you would have been wrong. Uh, and for the same reason, maybe it's a bit premature to be sure that closed models um, from, say, OpenAI will necessarily defeat the open source alternatives. Although that would be my intuition right now. Well, these things are like um, the biggest. So, what are the what are the main components that you actually have to marshal in order to get such a model off the ground? Apart from okay, so you need the compute and like the engineering. You can kind of open source the engineering. You can maybe um, someone can come in and sponsor the compute. Um, like the competitors can band together and sponsor the compute to do the training runs. Um, but then what about the data? Um, because at the moment, it seems like companies hold their data. They kind of hold that very securely. Um, you know, they've like 
rightfully mined it from all of the people that they exploited. So it's theirs. Um, and why would they? Why would they open source their data? Why would Facebook open source its behavioral data set that is amassed from um, billions of users over years and years? Yeah, I guess the. Uh... There do seem to be open versions of, I mean, the pile is open, for example, and it seems like competitors have managed to put together some data sets. I think OpenAI's magic source is probably, and as, as they've publicly said, they've put a lot of effort into curating and cleaning data sets um, so that it probably isn't trivial to replicate. I guess I would be fairly optimistic that open source efforts um, or... Maybe, maybe open source is the wrong term, like uh, collective efforts uh, of large tech companies. Maybe it's not open source, but maybe it is. Could replicate that. I guess the compute, there's a lot of competition for GPUs, so maybe the prices make it... I mean, it's it's unclear how that will go. There, there may be... Uh, depends how, how much of a plateau there is between each sort of step change in capability, right? How the How the availability of GPUs goes. But actually, I, w- I would tend to think that the advantage of the closed systems would be over here in engineers and tacit knowledge. So if you take TSMC, for example, with semiconductors, um, the, the shortage there is engineers and tacit knowledge. Uh, so there's, it's very, very hard to make those chips, and a lot of the knowledge required is not in books and maybe can't even be written down exactly, right? It's... Uh, kind of institutional knowledge that seems very hard to replicate Um, and i don't know obviously but reading the training documents for the opt models from meta and some of the other logs that that people have put up about training large language models it does seem that there's a a significant amount of black magic involved that is uh, not something you can just find in a tutorial online or a book or something so maybe maybe that's a bottleneck for the um the open source versions, but they do seem to be, um, you know, they're further along than I would have expected. I haven't paid a lot of attention to the open source models, but. Um, Okay, so the other, so apart from open source versus centralized models, I guess there's, yeah, well, that would fit in here. I mean, there's whether or not, whether or not a country like Australia, for example, will be able to stockpile enough GPUs to to actually do anything. Uh, there, I suppose, one should mention the the efforts that have seemed to be underway in the UK to form a national task force or something like that to, to train large language models. I assume part of that is acquiring a lot of GPUs with a national budget. I <laughs> very much doubt there's anything similar uh, bubbling up in the Australian government, but who knows? Um, so, yeah, I suppose that's the way that would happen uh, with sort of national government-led efforts. And obviously there's no reason why they can't compete in terms of expenditure with with tech companies, although it's a matter of finding the will to do it. About data, I might, I might sort of take back my original point. It does seem like you could train, you could sponsor the sort of data set and the compute as a large tech company without actually sharing your data. Because some companies are willing to share models trained on data, even if they wouldn't have been willing to share that data source itself. Right. Um, you can think of it like, imagine if the LLM kind of goes and does an internship at Facebook and uses Facebook's data to learn. And then it goes and does an internship at another company and uses their data set. Uh, and then it, the final model that is learned from all of these different data sets is released. Open source. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wait. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, what's your instinct about whether Australia should, I mean, should we be defunding Area X, uh, like 
let's get rid of half the universities, take the money, train <laughs> train a GPT-4 competitor? Is that just a waste of time for a country like Australia? Or is this table stakes for rem remaining a sovereign nation? Mm. Well, I'm not sure. I mean, well, I don't have an answer to that question, but an interesting question that I think I, I have as well is um, Google is not just an American company. It also has um, offices all over the world, including in Sydney. Um, and I think this might be partly because if you want to, if you want, if you want Australians to use your Google products, it does actually help to have an Australian version, like a local version, not just local servers, but also there are some laws. Um, the Privacy Act in Australia requires some types of data to be stored onshore rather than overseas. Um, when so that applies to all companies who are using IT. Um, so maybe that's part of the reason why there's a Google Australia. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not saying that, you know, we've got Google Australia, so we'll be fine. I guess I'm also I'm saying something more like, um, does the US actually have Google? Or I don't know. Um, like maybe we're in a similar relation to Google as the US is. That is Australia might be in a similar relation to Google as mm. the US is. Yeah, I take your point, but the Google, I mean, the Congress can call the CEO of Google and uh, the Australian Parliament cannot, for one thing. And uh, I'm not sure it, there is some influence, but the, the leverage we have over Google Australia is Google's profits in Australia, which is a tiny percentage of their overall profits. Right. Right. Okay. So. So the leverage that, because because Google America could kind of like move to Australia if they didn't like what Congress was doing, right? Mm -hmm. But you're saying that, well, the, no, because they would actually lose something more, which is the 300 million population of users, whereas we only have 20 million. Yeah, and I guess I mean, it, I, I, there's sort of a there's a context question, right? Which is, are we talking? In, we're sort of mostly talking in the context of the present day or near term future, but. If we imagine a bit further out where the data centers containing these AIs are the most strategic assets on planet Earth, then, well, if Google's data centers are, you know, 80% of them are in the US, then the US has them one way or the other, right? That's the, the government, yeah, you know, can do what it likes with those data centers fundamentally, and the Australian government um, can't. Can I ask, uh, uh, these are, I'm sure, silly questions, um, but but hopefully you guys are more familiar than I am with the hardware requirements and basically just the, the, the raw compute demands of these of the various stages of development and deployment of, of, um, of these AI systems. But is it is it absolutely necessary to use dedicated uh, custom design, you know, sort of silicon, uh, in order to train the model. In other words, it, our GPUs or you know, uh, tensor processing units. I think it's another one. TPUs, and mm -hmm. I know that some there's some supercomputer architectures that have been developed specifically for you know different types of machine learning. Are these absolutely necessary in order to train the models at something approaching the cutting edge? Or is that something that could be outsourced slash crowdsourced to, you know, some sort of SETI at home, you know, protein folding at home <clears throat> sort of style? Is that just completely implausible? I mean, I, I saw an open source effort talking about having 100,000 GPUs, and that struck me as being a fairly modest number. Um, if you could get 100 million users, to let you train on their idle, C, you know, CPU cycles on their devices, and their phones and their laptops and whatnot, is that would that be worthless? Would that be useless? Just given the nature of the 
computing requirements, or is is there any hope of um, uh, competing on a training front with dedicated hardware if you have a big enough crowd that you're crowdsourcing to? I guess is, is my is, that's that's a, the first of several technical questions, or not quite technical but questions about the hardware requirements. Um, yeah, is that uh, is that ridiculous, or is that something that would that, that you know would be a viable alternate path for training large models? I think there's academic groups working on exactly that kind of distributed training. Uh, I've seen some rough calculations. I mean, the, the bottleneck is often. I mean, if you're if you're training a, a model that has hundred billion parameters, you have this problem of. Uh, communicating between the different nodes that are actually doing the the calculation of the gradients um, and that's a lot of data to move between the nodes so it's actually the interconnect between the GPUs or whatever's you know the structure of your system is like a TPU so the I mean the, the most the TPU version 4 has like some fancy optical reconfiguration where you can reconfigure the connections between the nodes in software because it's like bouncing lasers off mirrors and you can realign the mirrors and shit like that. Okay, so that's an indication of the engineering effort going into speeding up the interconnect between the nodes and that are doing the, the compute uh, and what people feel is necessary in order to you know get to the next level. That That tends to argue that doing distributed training is going to be very heavily bottlenecked on on the communication between the nodes. It's not that parallelizable. That's that's my understanding. And maybe there's a breakthrough there or a different kind of training, perhaps. Um, but I feel like it's probably unlikely that that's going to be competitive in the near term. Uh, maybe someone else here has looked into it in more detail and can comment. Yeah, your thought there that is, if that's true, then that kind of shifts the balance of power, uh, perhaps back in the direction of national governments to an extent. Would that be right, or at least the the crowd? Well, I mean, one would ho hold out hope that uh, the that the, the the technology would naturally. Uh, admit multiple different types of organizations into this arms race rather than just a single type of organization that is able to leverage a single type of power or, or, or resource and and accrue an insurmountable advantage and and it, that's seldom the case unfortunately but uh it, it, it would be it would be a probably a good thing for civilization if it were possible if it were possible to train these systems with large crowds of distributed computational resources instead of only being able to train them at the peak levels uh, with dedicated hardware that is only accessible to a very rarefied uh, type of organization or, or, or interest or stakeholder that's that's unfortunate and, and if that's the reality it's a, that's just the, the reality well there it is but it's it would be sort of you know just bad luck in terms of fate and destiny if, if it turned out that there's it's the only way you can be a competitor in this race is to be a giant corporation or a government it would be a much more beautiful picture if it were possible for communities to participate in this. And um, I don't know whether or not that's, that's the case. It's least, at least on the training front. My follow-up question then is what about running these models and mm -hmm. actually making the services available? I, I have a poor, e an equally poor understanding of the compute resources that are necessary to, to run a model that once it has been trained and that's another similar sort of question. Is it unreasonable to hope that these models can be run by crowds uh, or can they only be run 
in large centralized facilities that are controlled by um, governments or, or mega corporations. I mean, so imagine imagine if you could if you could run Google's search locally on a local machine. And that might take some of Google's power away. It might take some of their market dominance and, and, and control in the They did sell an appliance. They did sell an appliance that did exactly that. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Sorry. I was just wanted to note that Google did sell an appliance that you put in your own data center that did exactly that. I'm not sure if that's still a product they provide, but that's yeah, that's a valid business model for people training large models, yeah. Wow, I didn't, I didn't have any idea that was actually a product at any scale. I, I'm ima I was uh, imagining at the scale of end users, you know, you, and mainly because I've seen some quite extraordinary achievements with, uh, I think the most recent one that I saw was uh, a, a, language, a language model running, was it um, Llama? From the, based on Stanford yeah. team's method, and honestly, I mean the performance that was achievable on a high-end laptop computer was astonishing. I mean, simply astonishing. Now, yes, the training was done elsewhere, but the the, the model was running locally, and it was incredible. And we know that that uh, the performance of hardware that individuals own is going to improve over time. Um, so. 10 years from now, one could imagine being able to run uh, quite substantially more powerful models on a local machine than you can today. And that that might be affordable for, you know, tens or hundreds of millions of people. And that is also a sort of a future that one might think is, a, is, is, is preferable to one in which we all simply subscribe to services that are provided and thus that are ultimately control, owned and controlled by um, uh, consolidation, centralized uh, power and authority, whether it's private in the hands of corporations or, or public in the hands of governments. So, yeah, that, that would be my other question is, is how feasible is it to actually run the cutting edge models on local hardware versus just having to pay for an account and access it, you know, either through whatever channels there are, whether you, know, you access it with sophistication through an API that's offered or whether you access it through chat window in your browser or a personal assistant app on your phone or whatever it might be is it is it unreal unrealistic to, to hope that there might be a bit more local control over these things or is it is that also naive yeah to be clear when i said earlier that google is providing that uh, i meant google search uh, not not the large language models so this is some years ago you could get a google right, search yeah, appliance yeah, yeah. I, I don't know I, I haven't heard anything about an analogous thing uh, currently for what the hell is going on with this thing? I'm sorry, this orb is doing something weird. Okay, that's better. Um, yeah, but I think that's right. Uh, it's certainly, I mean, I've heard a lot of, I was talking to, um, uh, was it Rishni? Uh, but I think I was also talking to my, my sister about um, people using Office and having to switch off these integrations. I mean, just go in and turn off all the integrations with GPT-4 because the organization quickly adopts a policy of not exfiltrating all their data to Microsoft servers, which makes sense. I mean, probably it's already there anyway if you're editing a live document online in Microsoft 365. Uh, but, you know, the idea of then passing it further through OpenAI's, is, you know, large language model or whatever, every detail of your organization. Um, I mean, it's a bit, bit much to swallow. So maybe people just just take it on the chin because otherwise their org is not going to be able to compete. That actually would be my prediction. Um, or the larger organizations with more sensitive information may, hard, hard to imagine they'll all be training their own models, but uh, maybe they have sort of appliances in-house that do it. But yeah, you're also pointing to the big difference in scale required to train versus deploy these models, which is a good point. So you could imagine that a country like Australia could certainly afford enough GPUs to run uh, a large model locally, um, just in inference mode, uh, and sort of have various relationships at the national government level or the corporate level, which, you know, 
uh, guarantee a supply of updates to that and so on. And much like, I mean, Australia is about to hand over hundreds of billions of dollars to to the US and um, the UK in order to get nuclear submarines. <laughs> um, and, well, we'd never be able to maintain those systems without engineering expertise and parts and stuff that are, you know, presumably there'll be a contract that says the Americans will keep supplying them um, for the lifetime of those submarines. So there's, there's a, and there's a debate around sovereignty about those, about those relationships, right? Like if a critical pillar of our defense is a system that we can't actually build or maintain ourselves without extensive help from the outside, uh, is our defense actually our defense? This strikes me as a bit overblown. Most medium to small countries are in this position fundamentally. They're buying arms from elsewhere. It's not, it's not like necessarily that you don't have sovereignty just because you rely on a weapon system from somewhere else. Uh, so I, I guess I would tend to think that maybe AGIs fall in that bucket. It's like the government goes out of its way. It makes relationships with other governments. There's buddy-buddy relationships at the the national government level and then you get access to the AGI of the Americans or whatever. Maybe it's in some local instantiated form. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the way that nuclear weapons also work perhaps. Uh, you mentioned before, Dan, that um, the data centers are presu presume where the training rather than inference is going on. Uh, the, the data centers that are training the AGIs become strategically the most relevant sort of um, factors in the landscape, and they would be in the US. Um, but because they're so strategically important, it kind of seems like you wouldn't put you wouldn't just have one, for example, um, because that creates too big a vulnerability in like one physical location. Um, and so you might spread them around and you might spread them around throughout different countries as well. Uh, mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. you were a corporation um, rather than, so the, so the US government might not want you to uh, they might want you to not have your data center in one place, but have it in multiple places across the country. But you as a corporation would maybe have incentives to have some of your um, training places in other countries as well. And so it might end up being that no single country has access to the full um, picture. Although, you know, if you have 80% of, um, of the data centers, then maybe you um, you're in a position to stomp the country that has 20% anyway, but yeah. Mm. Yeah, I guess what I'm sort of uh, dancing around is just the statement that is uh, already countries like Australia pick sides in some sense, right? So they will, I mean, Australia puts a lot of effort into maintaining a relationship with the Americans, partly because our defense depends on it. Uh, partly because some aspects of our... I mean, actually, I'm not sure how critical the relationship with the Americans is for economic performance. A major trade partner is, of course, China. I, I don't know that it would make so much difference if there were more tariffs on exports to the US. Nor am I sure that there are a lot of critical inputs into our economy that depend on, depend on the US. Uh, but you could imagine in a world with AGIs that that would that would become part of the existing military and geopolitical relationship that our access to those systems in somehow a preferred way uh, would be part of that that relationship. Well, and, and for a country like Australia, almost certainly, perhaps quite small countries as well geographically but certainly for a huge country like australia with a relatively small population uh economic production and capacity will eventually and by eventually i don't mean 50 years from now but it's much sooner than that uh it, it will it will converge with artificial intelligence 
uh, capacity because all production advantages that currently exist in China and that motivate having China as a trade partner for a country like Australia, those will be op virtually all will be obviated by artificial intelligence it's, it, once it's instantiated in robotics that's actually productive in a uh, material sense, in, in a real sense, in a, in a tangible sense. Right now, that's still, of course, quite a ways away. It's quite, very much quite science fiction at this point, but I can easily imagine on a 10 to 15 year time horizon, very highly automated factories opening in Australia, uh, completely obviating the low cost of labor advantage that Chinese suppliers have. And most of that tra trade relationship uh, being undermined. And then as a result, an emergent dependence upon the AI and the robotics expertise and resources and partnerships that provide those, if it's from the Americas, you know, that would trend, that would, uh, it, it, the, 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 the one would eat the other, is, I guess is what I'm saying. And I don't think that's something that we should pretend it's 50 or 100 years away, but it's something more like 10, uh, it becomes a, a substantial phenomenon in 10 to 20 years perhaps faster, but but I think realistically within 20 years, we're going to see massive relocalization of production using artificial intelligence, robotics, and automation. And especially for resource wealthy, resource rich nations. So Singapore would struggle with this, but uh, Australia? Why would Australia trade with China if it can make every widget and plastic gizmo and everything you can imagine locally with robots instead of 4,000 miles away with, you know, indentured servitude and slavery, basically, as labor. Yeah, I think that's a good point. <laughs> so one of the reasons it seems like Australia probably is fundamentally fine is, well, uh, it's not like we're exporting primarily uh, services to the world in the form of call centers like India is or... Uh, low skilled programming services like india is things that clearly seem to be on the chopping block tomorrow um <laughs> our economy is actually in, it, certainly in terms of its exports uh very low i mean it's we're like the 13th highest gdp country in the world uh gdp per capita here is, is about sixty thousand us dollars in america it's seventy thousand so you know it's it's pretty close in terms of per capita gdp uh but the the exports of australia is is very simple like there's these metrics that kind of <laughs> tell you how close you are to being a petro state right and like just exports oil and that's it uh, and australia does very badly on those rankings as you uh, if you have a look at these figures for the for the exports uh, the, the board thing is kind of not working very well but um so we export about 30, 343 billion US dollars worth of stuff every year. And, you know, if you go down the list, it's it's iron and then it's coal and then gas uh, and then education, interestingly, which is bigger than you might think. So that's uh, somewhere above gold. Oh, there's travel next. So tourism. Uh, that probably <laughs> went down by a factor of half over the last few years, but probably coming back, gold, uh, and so on. And then it's like farming stuff after that. Uh, yeah, I'm interested in your take, Adam, on what happens to commodities. So you could imagine, I guess, two stories, right? Maybe both are true, and I don't know how to balance them, where on the one hand, in the near term, uh, it's not like the usage of commodities like iron necessarily changes a lot as a result of the next few years worth of AI development. But once it takes off in factories in terms of manufacturing, I mean, the automated factories need inputs. And so if they scale, then the inputs have to scale. You'd have to think that the the price of iron is, is going to go up uh, the price of these raw inputs will go up, then there will be a large scale out of automated mining. That's actually the place where the Australian government is investing in terms of AI research, quite intelligently, I would think. Um, okay, so those will be heavily in demand and Australia will do fine as a result. But, well, also, 
uh, why why is Australian iron able to command a high price in the market? Uh, partly it's high grade, but partly it's very difficult to run mines well. And famously, you know, uh, China's been trying to play off the Australian mines against mines in South America and uh, sort of been let down over and over and over again by those mines not running very well. But logistics, uh, running mines is probably going to change fundamentally as a result of automation. Maybe it's much easier to scale out mines in previously unfeasible places as a result of uh, technical progress in robotics. So Australia's advantage might also slip. Uh, I don't know what your take on countries dependent on commodities is. Well, the near term is very, very murky. It's it's that that where the real difficulty is 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 navigating from from the present toward some milestone or 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 uh, some condition. Never, never a permanent one. Or, uh, never a fixed destination. Of course, that's a, that's fallacious thinking. But, but if you take any two points on the road, the tricky part is figuring out all the details, anticipating the details between them. When it's easier to imagine the stops along the route than all of the details along the way. Having said that, um, my very high level, sort of thirty-five thousand foot view on on. Uh, on what happens to commodities amidst technological abundance or superabundance is uh, I, I, I'm, a, I'm I guess it, it, the answer in my mind is that it depends on fundamentally on two rather strange things. The first is uh, what are the actual limits of human wants uh, in terms of consumption like is it, 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 the the original naive assumption that human wants are unlimited, that there's they're, that they're infinite, there's no limit to them, uh, was part of the whole economic uh, original sort of spherical cow uh, simplified assumption. Uh, I, I think that we have a lot of instances, specific instances in the real world that show us that human needs, human needs and wants are not infinite, but they can be pretty large. And so that's the first question to ask is is where are the actual where are the actual limits because th they really do matter if if people if every individual is really going to want a fleet of 100 private vehicles including a handful of you know aircraft and spacecraft and 10 different private dwellings around the world well you know it's going to take a lot of resources to build all of that if we, if it turns out that people really don't want all of those things, and that the lifestyle that the majority of people would choose, even if they had, a, even if even if money were no object, uh, say for example, you look at the world's billionaires, you know what what where are the limits on what the world's billionaires consume? Does Bill Gates have a hundred jets, even though he could afford them, or does he only have one or two? I don't know the answer to those questions, but those are those are I think going to become very important questions if we're going to if we're going to try to figure out okay what are you know what what do what does a super abundant uh, production system for the planet actually look like? That's the first thing, and then the second thing is uh, even if resources are available in principle in a given location whether it's Australia or a smaller country or, or anywhere else. Um, and they're simply there in lower concentration than has been economically viable in the past. That doesn't automatically mean that, un that, that uh, a superabundance of energy and labor will make those resources um, uh, available in a compelling way. And the reason why I think here is the second major factor, which is time. Because time will still be a constraint and time will still be something valuable to the world to, in, you know, at every scale from individuals on up to entire nations. So what I mean by that is even if you even if there were in principle all of the iron that you could that you could consume up to the limit that I just described a minute ago. Uh, 
And even if you had all of the energy that you needed to obtain that and all of the labor that you needed to obtain that at effectively zero cost. So you had a super abundance of energy from whatever technologies, clean energy, solar, wind, fusion, if we make a breakthrough. And you had an unlimited supply of uh, cost, very low cost, near zero marginal cost, especially, but very, very low cost labor in the form of robots. Even if you had both of those conditions met, uh, if you have poor deposits of iron compared to a, a neighboring country, you're, you're, you're not going to be able to produce it as quickly. You, it, your production would be slower. Right. So it, just because you have a, just because you alleviate the constraints of energy and labor, which are major constraints, that's absolutely true. Uh, and even if things become costless, that doesn't mean they become instantaneous. And it could be that competition on the basis of speed Hmm. Uh, is becomes highly relevant in a world where competition on the basis of the cost of energy or the cost of labor's inputs is be, ceases to be relevant. And so I think it's a little bit naive to think that there will be no competition and no advantages anywhere, because time will still be something that's that's relevant no matter what. Um, that will continue to distinguish one region from another, and a, a region with enormous resource endowments will have, if nothing else, a speed advantage over a region over a region that has relatively poorer resource endowments mm. and this is true even if every region in principle can get everything they want i mean you could you know you could you could dig a hole 200 miles deep and you know obtain all of the metal and r rare earths everything you can imagine in that quantity of material i mean we, we live on a gigantic ball of rock and metals and there's no shortage of these things but they really are more conveniently located uh, in some places than others. And that means that they're going to be more quickly extractable, even if there's no cost to the labor or energy or other inputs into those processes. And I think that that, so, so, so the, the huge resource rich countries are still going to enjoy a massive advantage, if nothing else in terms of raw speed at which they can continue to advance. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, so that so it's these these two things that are that are sort of square in the center of my, you know, thinking at the moment on what does a what does a super abundant an energy and labor super abundant future look like? Well, then it, then new constraints emerge, and what are those new constraints? Well, speed is one of them. The limits on on demand are one of them. I mean, basically, you're asking, the question is what what is a constraint when our traditional ideas of supply constraints no longer apply? Mm. And then you have other things that are that are constraints on the system. Demand is something that becomes a constraint, and um, time or speed becomes a constraint as, as as two key factors. There are other factors, but those become particularly, I think, uh, important in my view. So, yeah, so sorry to launch into a domain of theorizing that I've been working on for the last several months, but no, but, that's uh, cool. Uh, you you crack the door open, and I I jump. I jump <laughs> there. No, the, what that makes me think is. Like in the in the in the present and past, we have war over access to resources, but uh, maybe in a few years we'll have a war over access to a new matrix multiplication algorithm. Because if you get it, then you'll you'll make every AI in your civilization 0.1 percent faster, and that will be like a massive <laughs> change. <laughs> so, <laughs> so study math, everybody. <laughs> You're the soldiers of the future. <laughs> Yeah, um, I guess on that basis, Australia seems like it's probably fine. I don't know. Uh, does it sitting there in the uh, in the future and present hegemon, Adam? Uh, like, uh, do you think it's a problem that we're unlikely to have our own groups competing at the cutting edge in large language models? Uh, I mean, if I were to be called up tomorrow by somebody who matters and asked for advice on Australia's AI policy, I, I would actually struggle to know what to say. I mean, the, the easy thing to say, which is, you know, more money, more money, let's spend more money on training large transformers, let's, let's be competitive, but it could easily just flop, right? I mean, it's so easy for countries to spend a lot of money on these things and just have them be kind of pathetic. Uh, China does it all the time, right? Tries to catch up with a given area of technology. And if you don't have the people, there'll always be people who put up their hands for the cash and then they'll get it and they'll do something. But 
it may not even get you that much closer to to your priorities. Uh, I can easily imagine if Australia set aside, you know, it would be crazy to imagine anything as large as $10 billion. Uh, but suppose it was $10 billion. Would that actually make a difference? Or would it just like kind of get frittered away into 200 existing groups and sort of not actually reach the people who could who could do some good with it? I would tend to be inclined to think it would be the latter. So uh, I'm not so optimistic that just racing to catch up is actually like a strategic priority for Australia, despite, you know, despite looking at the situation and kind of thinking that if we don't have it, maybe, maybe we lose even more of our sovereignty to the Americans. But it's not obvious to me what I would do if I were in charge either. I don't know if I have a, I have any strong thoughts or comments on that in particular. Um, one thought that does occur to me is, I, or I, let me phrase it in a question, which is, what does trade look like in a post-scarcity condition? So, so right today nations trade with one another because one or the because one or the other will have you know a variety of advantages or disadvantages that the other is making up for in in production um and maybe that will continue to be the case and maybe there will always be things that can be produced that it is it is better or easier or faster again to invoke speed simply faster to purchase from somebody else than to make yourself right um the essence of trade really is that you are you're exchanging time that you put into one thing uh into for somebody else's time that they put into something else I mean, that's really what your what trade is is or at least that's one way to look at what trade trade ultimately reduces to uh but one could imagine in a post scarcity condition in the future that there are very few advantages that or, or, or to to purchasing anything or even to, and on the flip side of that to selling anything that you've produced uh if localized production is 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 trivial now, maybe speed is of the essence here, and it will continue to be the basis of the economy going forward. I, 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 I guess I could produce this at home. Yes, I could print out a new car in my 3D printer, but that would take six hours, and I'd rather have it in five minutes, so I'll pay money for, for it from the place that can do it in five minutes. Um, but it, where are the limits to that? And then if you think of between nations, well, uh, what is... What 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 are countries going to sell to one another, and use as the basis uh, for accruing currency, which they then use for purchases? I, I don't know the answer to that, but the the um, it, maybe maybe it is a valid assumption that we'll continue to find things to sell, and uh, and that there will continue to be advantages. I mean, um, presumably there will continue to be tourism. You can't. I mean, I guess you could visit Australia in virtual reality, but it's not the real thing. Uh, presumably there will continue to be authentic works of artistic expression and so forth and people will be willing to pay for those so the economy will presumably the, you know there will continue to be some scarcity in the economy and people will it will form the basis of trade and currency and all the rest of that stuff but uh, I, 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 it does come to mind I mean where's where does Australia get the money to buy these services from America with if that's if right America yeah. is able to just make ab is if America if, is, is independent in its production I mean are you gonna what, what happened doesn't do, here's another question does artificial intelligence facilitate radical isolationism economically and if it does then then how do you access the trade partnerships with isolationists and it's, and that's maybe not a problem if, if you know um, your trade partners don't have absolutely critical goods and services that you need that you can't get anywhere else. You can get your iron from somebody else if America won't sell it to you. Uh, but if 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 U.S. If, if Google, based in the United States, is the only AI 
game in town and you have to buy it from them, well, you know, um, what if they don't want to sell it to you? What if they don't need to sell it to you? What if you can't afford, what if they just say, wow, that'll be $10 trillion, please. Oh, you can't pay it? Well, we don't care. Um, mm. You know, what, what, what does, what, and, and that's not that unrealistic right now. I mean, the, the very poor countries are already in a situation like that with respect to wealthy countries. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, I, 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 sorry to kind of knock the, the, the conversation off kilter there with a bunch of goofball questions. Um, but I don't know how to answer your core question um, on a sort of on a 20 odd year time frame where all this other crazy stuff seems to become operative, you know? Hmm. Yeah, I think there's a, a pretty clear picture there, which I would agree with, which is that uh, there will be tiers of these systems for some time, right? Where, I mean, right now, Okay, a few years ago, there, there weren't really tiers where, well, we had GPT-2 or, you know, you could access GPT-3 through the API or through the playground, but nobody really did it. Uh, but we're moving into an era where there are multiple systems available, often even from the same vendor. So you can still access not only GPT-3, but even older models, Curie and Adder. Um, they're cheaper, they're less capable. Um, for example, the bots here are making use of Adder. That's how the summary vectors are generated for querying. It's much, much cheaper than running GPT-3, let alone GPT-4. Uh, so there will be, over time, a continuum of these systems at different price points with different capabilities. Uh, and the not only will they differ in price, but they will differ in accessibility. So... I think there's still geographic fencing around GPT-4, not because of government regulation, but just because they haven't rolled it out everywhere. Uh, certainly, you're waitlisted for access to the API, and I think that probably has a geographic element. Who knows? Um, but you can imagine the cheaper models are more widely available, both geographically and otherwise with less restrictions, both because of the companies that are providing them and because some of them are open sourced. Um, yeah, that's right. In Italy, <laughs> yeah, I am. I, I think there is incredible competence in the EU in uh, in turning Europe into a museum. I don't know, like the 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 instinct to uh, to make GPT like technologies illegal is is something to behold. Maybe I'm missing something there, but it feels like a massive uh, self sabotaging going on. So there will be a, a widespread access to systems, but perhaps at various levels. And if you go right up to the very top, um, well, there is clearly like a, a boundary where the price changes discontinuously for access to GPT-4, right? There's a boundary which contains OpenAI and Microsoft where effectively they're running, they're running systems on top of that service with an internal accounting that is very different from the external price. Uh, so Microsoft will deploy Office 365 and the built-in access to whatever they call their system, but fundamentally GPT-4, uh, in a way that would not be economic for anybody else using the API to do. Um, and they will, yeah, we were sort of discussing this on the, on the Discord over the last week, uh, they have a perfect incentive to do that, right? To take advantage of their, their their tech edge in order to capture markets by effectively pricing out other cognitive labor, whether that's humans or other AI systems. Um, so you can sort of see these concentric rings of access with different price tiers within them. Some of it is geo geographical and some of it is just strategic within markets. But exactly where those borders are drawn and where those price drops are strikes me as like equivalent to national borders or something perhaps going forwards. Uh, it, it feels in incredibly consequential which side of each one of those borders you are in terms of access and price. Um, yeah, that would be my response to, to your comment, Adam. That made me think of something um, where you know, if you have a... So if you think of an economy as kind of about solving a problem of uh, routing resources to 
like particular use cases and it bottoms out in people um, most of the time making sort of choices and sort of revealing what they value through those choices. So, so the economy is kind of trying to efficiently allocate resources um, to people. Um, well, when you talk about a continuum of tiers, um, you could kind of think of that as like how much, how, how are you allocating your intelligence uh, resource as in your AI, the, like intelligence as like a quantity, like how much intelligence do you want to spend um, on this answering this user's query versus summarizing this prompt versus mm. doing this work uh, as uh, Bing Sydney. Um, so it, the intelligence, it's not exactly the same as these tiers because you've kind of got uh, like part of the reason that the smaller models are cheaper is because they're using less computation. It's not the whole reason. Um, as we discussed in a previous talk, um, price is not equal to cost. Um, so, uh, but but there's like maybe there's like a couple of dimensions about like how many parameters you're using, how much computation you're using, how many um, like it, it becomes similar to kind of like how a person um, allocates their cognitive resources in terms of like choosing what to pay attention to, and what problems to work on, and and that kind of thing. But at an economy-wide scale or at a worldwide scale, um, maybe even if there's, yeah, maybe before abundance, um, we're more likely to have a bottleneck on the total amount of um, intelligent computation that can go around coming out of these models. And then we'll see an economy kind of emerge that is about allocating that resource of you know, attention um, mm. or intelligence or cognition or something like that. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and, and just to just to piggyback on that, uh, maybe it's literal or maybe it's a just a metaphor. But in in real economies, you have sort of formal markets, and then you have gray and black markets, right? Mm -hmm. You have sort of informal economies. Uh, on some sort of spectrum or, or dimension of some kind. Um, and some of them are, are, you know, some informal economies are legal and perfectly legitimate, and then some are uh, illegal. And I wonder if the something directly analogous might happen uh, with, lo with using local and or open source alternatives so maybe you have maybe that you have to pay to get to, as today you have to pay through the nose to get access to gpt4 which is the cutting edge that's a exit that's you know that's accessible to widely um uh and then there are cheaper alternatives that you can pay for but at some point it, it becomes possible to have you know a model running locally that you set up yourself or that's open source or something like that, that's about as good as the low cost offerings from, you know, open AI or whatever. And then you have a situation where you have a, an informal economy competing with the lower end of the formal economy. And I, this is not unusual. This happens in the real world too, right? I mean, you can, if you want a really, really great, super high quality, job done on some home improvement thing. Say I'm looking at, out my window right now. So say somebody you want new windows, you want really great new windows, you got to pay through the nose to have, you know, some some very skilled people come out and use some very good uh, uh, hardware, you know, very high end materials. Um, and then you get very nice windows, uh, you could pay a much smaller amount of money and get a lower quality result. And at some point, you could get the same result if you just, you know, get the thing, order the materials yourself, and do the work yourself. And uh, then you have sort of an informal economy and a formal economy at the low end of the market alongside one another. There's nothing illegal about any of that, although I suppose there are, I mean, you can, in the United States, at any rate, you can illegally pay for labor. Um, and, uh, and, so there is a gray market, certainly, if not a black market, for for labor. 
for, for you know, construction work or whatever. Um, so it may be that there is that there are that we that we ought to expect analog very much analogous, if not directly parallel uh, patterns to emerge and economies to emerge, both formal and informal, around the the supply of intelligence and attention. And um, maybe another question to ask is at at which stages, at which points in the evolution of this technology do do some of those, I'm, I'm thinking not all of them, but it, do some of those forms of intelligence or pre perhaps some levels or tiers, I think you used the word tier earlier, Dan, when do those become commodi commodified, commoditized? Mm -hmm. So when does intelligence of a certain level or capability become just a commodity? When does, when does attention at a certain level of or a certain capability become commoditized. And um, that, 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 yeah, that might be uh, something we're thinking about as well in the context of a discussion about formal and informal economies. <laughs> Think it yourself. That's great. <laughs> Did you see that? <laughs> That's good. Yeah. yeah, that's good. I like that. Yeah, <laughs> it's like the, awesome. it's like the shitty version that, like you know, you're sort of a bit hesitant to step out on the barbecue deck if you know they built it themselves. <laughs> it's like, wait, wait, wait! You thought this through yourself? Yeah, oh, yeah. That's okay. well. There's, this, there's the, another phrase which is um, play on words. You know, it's a pun on DIY, and it's D I W H Y D I Y. Like, why did you do that yourself? <laughs> um, and DIY is a, I mean, you can go on various websites on the internet and find hilarious examples of, <laughs> and I'm using scare quotes here in the air, home improvement. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, I mean, you, like you said, Dan, if, if you, if you wouldn't, uh, wouldn't want to walk around on a deck that some knucklehead built themselves out of you know, scrap wood or something. So would you, would you really want to, would you really want to use a product or a service that, that some boneheaded human uh, produced with their own thinking? You know, why, <laughs> why, why did you do the thinking yourself when you could have, you could have had a machine do it properly for you? Um, yeah, so yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's good. <laughs> okay, um, I think I'm taking away from this that, uh, I mean, Australia's current trajectory which is to probably not invest enough in AI but if they were to invest more the government would prioritize investments that are relative to natural resource strengths and existing economic strengths so uh, probably it would make sense for I mean Australia has a very developed services economy and is, is kind of cutting edge and in some respects they're not necessarily technologically but in terms of training and, 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 and so on uh, to invest in upskilling there using AI tools and being uh, very productive. I mean, Australia is already uh, a very productive current country relative to the world um, to, to keep going with that and to double down on, on making resource extraction incredibly fast and efficient using automation. Uh, seems like in the near term, a strategy for having enough resources to at least be able to trade to get access to uh, proto AGIs and, and then the real thing when it arrives it's sort of unclear to me whether it's even worth planning beyond that right it's like I don't know uh, what are you supposed to do yeah so I guess I'm I, I feel relatively optimistic about Australia's position and, and all this certainly many many others are, are significantly worse off yeah for example Chinese people are incredibly concerned as I think they should be um, yeah, here's, an, here's a, a question I'm interested in maybe broaching and then we can continue it next week if, if nobody wants to comment on anything else. But uh, I think we're in a kind of overhang of expectations where the reality of what's about to happen hasn't caught up with people. We, we've talked about this in the sort of domestic context, I guess, uh, like American context um, uh, and Australian. But... If we talk geopolitically in, in terms of the decisions countries are making vis-a-vis -vis their position in the global economy and, and you know their local economic development, um, 
I think, you know, we're joking about, uh, you know, TIY and such things, but for a country like India, that's no joke, right? Uh, they, they have one of the ways in which they're attempting to develop is to use their population and their educational resources in order to position themselves as a provider of international services. They have many people who speak English. Uh, those comparative advantages and, and the ability to produce millions of, of, you know, pretty capable software engineers will fairly soon not be as much of a comparative advantage, um, let alone the prospects of what's going to happen to Chinese, the Chinese population in terms of the low-skilled manufacturing workers when, when automation in factories really kicks off over, you know, probably starting three or four years from now, I would guess. Um, I don't think that's been really priced into people's expectations of national power and, uh, and so on. <clears throat> So I don't know when that's going to happen, but that's going to be extremely dangerous uh, when this really sinks in for people. Like people still talk about US-China competition in a way that seems frankly kind of insane to me. Um, so yeah, wait, it'll still be a comparative advantage. Uh, well, I meant comparative to the world supply, right? I mean, it's, isn't comparative advantage when you, you you just look at your skills and you say what are the things that you're the most useful in and you it it's worth you doing that and someone else doing the other thing um because that leads to a more efficient kind of use of of the labor overall so so these countries will still have the same relative skills in different areas it's just that they'll no longer be able to derive as much benefit from the areas that they're skilled in because those areas become disrupted. Yeah, I guess that's true. Yeah, misusing the term probably. I guess I had in mind that it's effectively as though that capability from India was just copied and placed inside the American border, in which case it's, it's still, I agree, a comparative advantage, uh, but it's kind of doesn't translate into anything. Yeah, the general point is, is clear. Um, on the topic of population, um, if there's no, no, other, no responses to Dan's point, um, on a slightly different topic of population, um, data is obviously we've identified as one of the key resources in these um, areas. You know, would it be, would it, would it, be a sensible strategy to contemplate um, India or China just, you know, instead of training their sort of software developers or whatever, or call center workers or these things, just get everyone typing up their own like <laughs> data sets, um, you know, just basically being, um, becoming kind of like writing teaching materials for the baby AGIs. Um, and I wonder if you could actually, if you have China's population or India's population, if you could actually do something, if you actually create something there that was on the order of kind of um, scale and maybe even better in quality because it was deliberately created for the purpose of the web data sets that are being used to train the current generation of models. And then you would, as a country, have access to a crucial ingredient um, and another area that humans are used in the in the training process is in the tuning at the with the modern approaches to uh, with the current crop of approaches to alignment um these steps are actually already being outsourced to um workers in low-income countries it seems um yeah i wonder if that says that there's not that much that a country can kind of get in terms of economic value out of being the sort of grunt workers that do the data labeling um but yeah i don't know at least it takes you know if you if you know english or it, it doesn't even have to be english these you just it's at this point trivial for the agis to learn in other languages um you could just get your population if you're a large population country you could just get your population creating your own corpus which with which to train a large language model i wonder if that sounds like a plausible approach or if i'm kind of missing something in terms of scale yeah. Yeah. write a diary for write a diary for national glory 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine that being significant in terms of actually, uh, I mean, to take that from a slightly different angle, clearly the fact that the largest models are being trained in the US is a huge soft power advantage, right? So not only because, you know, California values are baked deeply into GPT-4, but more broadly, yeah. the worldview is sort of leaks out of the data set and, uh, and is a sort of American worldview in many respects. Um, if if you want, I mean, absent a sort of more more direct way to to insert that deep culture into a system, which maybe you don't know exactly how to do, um, having lots and lots of of data which just expresses the thoughts and the kind of worldview and the general culture of your country, and then training on that, or in addition training on that. You know, it doesn't strike me as crazy, but uh, it seems more like it's to do with, you know, useful for aligning something with your values than it is for like raw capability in some economic sense. Uh, I don't know that. Right. Right. So, so, well, the the data on the on the web, it, sorry, the data in the corpuses that are used for the current models, it's got some mix of like. Uh, um, just random posting about just random conversations that encode norms and stuff. But it's also, there's probably a bunch of technical topics where there are examples of reasoning and that is kind of key to the, some of the capabilities, presumably. Um, mm. So you would have to, you would have to kind of create a sufficiently cognitively rich data set if this, um, if this was to sort of work. And I guess that would be maybe a failure mode would be that um, actually, well, I don't know. I mean, if you actually make it people's full-time job to like create mm. rich, uh, sort of spend cognitive effort so that it never has to be spent again kind of thing. Um, and yeah, you, know, you could get your you could get programming examples. You could get uh, people just solving maths problems, um, generating and, and solving problems. Um, you could... You could get people who are working in kind of uh, higher skilled jobs um, to kind of be accompanied by, um, like I don't know, but if you just if you just sort of put a voice recorder on on someone, gave everyone like a little headset, and, and they mm -hmm. verbalized some of their thought process as they were doing work day to day, and they got like a huge economic benefit for doing that, um, then you could potentially have a high quality data set arise from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that this is this is a new a new the market for data. You know, this, I think we're going to see uh, some interesting forms of data supply emerge, given that there appears to me appears to be demand for data of various different types and and certainly very large data sets. So it's interesting interesting to ponder what the supply of data may look like and how companies or entire societies will, you know, what actions they might take to, to produce that supply to, to, you know, to, to, you know, and you could invoke metaphors to the physical world here, you know, how will they identify the resources and then organize to mine those resources and then who will own them and then, and then how will they uh, uh, distribute the benefits of selling those, you know, that, the, that mined data and so forth. It's an interesting thing to, to ponder. And I do wonder what, you know, are there forms of data that would be that a token prediction system or other uh, machine learning systems could 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 utilize, could take advantage of, uh, that are sort of not really on the radar yet? I mean, language is, is an obvious one. Um, uh, but walking around with, you know, a suite of sensors to capture what your a person sees it, that could be interesting, especially if it's correlated with language. Like if you're walking around and, and again narrating your thought processes as you're navigating through the physical world, you know, it might it might be that, that correlated data are useful. That mm -hmm. data, you know, visual data that are correlated with a, a, a text narrative are could have value for for token prediction of different kinds. And then I think I might have mentioned it last time, but I'm 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 both in, interested and excited, but also concerned about. Uh, 
about training on raw physical data, just data about the world, because because language, at the very least, uh, it has values, human values embedded in it. And so a system that trains on human language, one, I think it's, it's well, it's still contested, but I think it's fairly incontrovertible at this point that, that systems trained on human language are developing understandings of, you know, human ideas, including values and norms and morals and ethical systems and so forth. But if you were to just train on the, the, the physical world around you, uh, and I don't just mean for just to physically navigate it, like move through it, but but to interact with the world. And, um, you know, it's, it's not completely clear to me how, what, how, if any, you know, values that are recognizable must necessarily emerge from a, you know, a data set that's just, you know, the, the raw visual and, and auditory and um, tactile uh, sensory input from interacting with the world. And I, but I think that though I think that those data sets are going to be very valuable as well, I, I, certainly for for uh, robotics. I pretty sure I'm, 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 I'm open to being completely wrong here, obviously. And what do I know? I'm not an expert, but I, my intuition is that um, we are going to see a very par a very analogous sort of pattern emerge with robotics that, as we've seen here with language, where we spent decades trying to teach or program in systems to be able to speak and do chat and stuff. And it was, you know, that we were sort of banging our heads against the wall and never really worked very well. And then this new method seemed to crack the code and suddenly these systems show all these incredible emergent properties. They're very fluid, they're very human and natural-like and so forth. And I suspect the same is true with, with physical locomotion and their interaction with the world, where, you know, you've got Boston Robotics and things look pretty good, but those are all canned sequences and it's been hard coded by hand and it doesn't really work and it's not adaptive and generalizable to new areas or whatever. But that if we adopt a very similar token prediction based, you know, system, uh, something very much like an LLM that, and we have a lot of data and the data are gathered from sensory uh, acquisitions, sense data, then machines are going to demonstrate locomotion and other uh, emerging capability in terms of being able to interact with the world and predict how the world around them will respond to their activities and engagements in very, very analogous ways to what we've seen with language. Um, and so I suspect that those data will be really valuable, at least initially, too. Now, it could be that you only need to train that kind of system once, and, there's, and then why would you ever do it again? Um, I, I, maybe, I don't know. But, you know, having said that, um, maybe there is the potential for for a crazy level of proficiency to emerge, like a properly insanely superhuman level of proficiency to emerge physically that we don't see in humans ever. Uh, and um, so, you know, how, so for example, how good would a robot be at, I don't know, you know, boxing or, or judo or wrestling or something, if it trained on, you know, a million hours of, of, uh, you know, wrestling experience instead of just a few thousand, which is all an athlete can manage in the lifetime. Um, I'm probably pretty amazingly good. So I, I suspect we're going to see a wide variety of, of, of data being mined and then becoming sort of a, a, a source of value that's supplied in markets where there's demand and, and so forth. Um, yeah, I think I think there's where a risk the sensory of... data come from is a good question. I mean, this is this is an, it's something that I I, I uh, maybe it's wrong to appeal to to nature and biology for as a guide. I mean, I think we've seen that that's a mistake in the past. And, you know, airplane don't flap their wings as the classic example. So maybe this is not the right way to think about it. But one thing that that is you know interesting about um, animals, certainly mammals, is we have a crazy number of sensors just insane number of sensors. I mean, just your skin has got tens of millions of nerve endings. You've got millions of pain receptors and millions of heat receptors and millions of cold receptors and millions of pressure receptors. And then you've got all your proprioception receptors and you've got, you know, I mean, there's a lot of sensing and a fair amount of data. I don't know how much data really, but 
a fair bit of data coming in, but certainly huge numbers of sensors. Why do you need millions of sensors? I mean, do, 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 does a robot really need millions of sensors in its body in order to be able to walk smoothly, or can it get by with just a handful of key articulation points and or whatever? I don't know the answer to that, but it is weird that biology seems to have centered on this or, 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 or landed on this solution where there's good tons of sensing going on. Seems like crazy overkill, but I don't know, maybe not. Um, mm. So, but yeah, yeah data should... of, of, of exotic kinds, not just language, I think is a big part of the future here. Yeah, maybe this, this question of, to come back to the question of population, uh, maybe the value of human capital is something we can discuss next time, both in terms of like the the expected return on investment in human capital being a, a big question. Uh, we've talked about education in the past, but I, I think I'll I'll push back a little bit on the emphasis on data here. I think this might be a little bit of copium as well, right? And I think I, I wouldn't, if I was in the Chinese leadership, view it as, as very calming exactly. Uh, clearly right now that's true, right? We have this race for tokens, uh, we are maybe hitting some sort of limits in terms of how much data we can collect for training these systems. But I think this may be overfitting to the present moment. Uh, like sort of, you can you can be catching up with the present and uh, and not see that this paradigm has, has been in place now for, for five or six years, right? And I, I don't know that necessarily it will be like this in a few years. So people say, you know, there's this, I think, is it Andrew Ng that coined this term, data is the new oil? Um, this is false, right? Oil is valuable because it's intrinsically a container of energy. And then there's a question of how you release that energy. But data doesn't intrinsically contain any motive power, cognitive or otherwise, right? It's... Uh, once you learn from the data, you don't need to keep ingesting new data to perform cognitive work or to generalize or to extrapolate or to do things completely outside of your training set. You don't need a continual supply of data. Right now, we need a continual supply of data to keep training large language models. But think about Alpha Zero. Do you keep needing more human games in order to get better at Go? There's plenty of scope for, for just taking the existing data set and having more powerful systems that that don't need much more data in order to to extract as much as humans would extract from it and, and generalize from there. And indeed, that seems to me where the the bottleneck is already and where all the investment is going to go. And it's a question of how we crack that. So I, I think it's you could set up all your people with all these recorders in order to build a gigantic data set and then you've reorganized your economy uh and then you know the next day there's a breakthrough in silicon valley where it's like oh well actually you know the uh the, the 10 trillion tokens we had already were, were enough um so yeah. Uh, yeah yeah i don't know if that's such a reliable path to the future Right. So it's just it's just if you have nothing else and you need you need to be able to pay something to the people who have the models to be able to get into the um right. You know, to get to the table. Um that makes sense. And you you everything else that you need. You get my point. Yeah, or you can just bark in order to get treats. That's that's maybe the <laughs> That's maybe all you can do. Okay, I think we'll leave it there. We're over time already. Um, yeah, any final words, Adam? No, this has been great. Lots to think about. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everybody.